In this video, we will explore Eric Lerner's plasmoid quasar model, which significantly differs from the mainstream understanding of what a quasar is. Quasars were initially identified as objects with extremely high luminosity and significant redshift. In recent years, we've observed long jets extending outwards from these objects. Current scientific thinking describes quasars as ancient relics from the early universe, similar to active galactic nuclei found at the centres of galaxies, including our own. The belief that quasars are incredibly old is primarily based on their redshift. However, this presents a major problem, explaining their luminosity at such vast distances. To be visible at these distances, quasars would need to be about 10 to the power of 18 times more powerful than the largest galaxies. Additionally, there are issues with the relative speeds of gas being emitted. Some quasars seem to emit gas at speeds that would break the speed of light. The prevailing theory suggests that only supermassive black holes with an accretion disk could power such phenomena, creating jets above the black hole's poles. In contrast, we will explore a more straightforward approach based on laboratory experiments which matches this phenomenon to something very real and not so distant at all. Eric Lerner's Plasmoid Quasar Model This model uses principles observed in plasma physics to explain quasars without requiring the extreme distances and energies posited by the standard model. In the early 1960s, significant research was conducted into thermonuclear reactions and relativistic electron beams. Scientists discovered that as they powered up these machines, plasma would form a current sheet between the electrodes and be propelled down the chamber. This current sheet created vortex filaments which were force-free self-pinched structures resulting in a helical mass plasma flow. These filaments formed in contra-rotating pairs. As they reached the end of the electrodes, a hollow column was created which self-pinched forming several plasmoids. During this process, the pairs of filaments merged and annihilated each other through rapid reconnection of magnetic field lines, inducing currents along the axial sheath that far exceeded the input currents in the electrodes. The result of this process was the compression of a large fraction of energy stored in the magnetic field of the initial radial currents into the volume of the plasmoid. The volume decreased from about 5 cm, the distance between the electrodes, to the size of the plasmoid, which was about 50 by 400 microns. Even more incredible was the resulting increase in energy by a factor of 10 million. During their brief 100 nanosecond lifetime, the plasmoids did not lose any energy through synchrotron radiation, where the acceleration of an electron causes it to emit a high energy photon, slowing the electron down. This was mainly because the plasma within the plasmoid was opaque and the electron plasma frequency, which is how quickly the electrons oscillate in the plasma, was above the electron synchrotron frequency. As the plasmoids continued to self-pinch and the magnetic field strength grew, the plasma became transparent, allowing rapid radiation of energy. This is similar to an open circuit where the inductive field generates a huge electric field to maintain the enormous flow of current despite the rise in non-collisional resistance. These accelerating fields produced oppositely directed beams of electrons and ions with a vast energy spectrum. The emerging electron beam was not composed of a single filament but when examined was found to consist of thousands of filaments ranging in diameter from 1 to 300 microns. Each of these filaments was formed from many small fibres, typically less than one micron wide, which maintained their structure over several metres of propagation. The experimental test indicated that the fine structure of the emerging beams reflected the filamentary structure of the decaying plasmoid that produced the beam. The ion beam travelled at a much slower speed due to the heavier mass of the ions. Observations of this beam revealed that the beam production mechanism was not a smooth continuous process. Its structure was clumped, and further examination of the electron beam revealed the same structure but with much smaller spacing. It appeared as if both beams were being pulsed. Eric Lerner's model of the quasar is based on the process of magnetic self-compression that we've just discussed. The initial conditions involve a protogalactic cloud contracting and rotating within an intergalactic magnetic field. The existence of these intergalactic magnetic fields was first observed in the 1980s. Lerner's model required only that there be a component of the magnetic field parallel to the axis of rotation. Similar to the laboratory experiment, plasma in the protogalactic cloud streams against perpendicular lines of magnetic force, creating paired vortex filaments. 
These filaments allow the plasma to move through the background field with minimal energy loss. On a larger scale, the contracting plasma disc acts as a generator, producing currents that flow towards the centre in the plane of rotation, where the density is highest, and then out through the central axis of rotation, following Alphane's galactic circuit. The in-streaming filaments follow the magnetic field lines and are therefore force-free. Initially, the current flow is symmetrical, with half flowing through the north axis and half through the southern axis. At this stage, the pinching filaments are already storing a considerable concentration of magnetic field energy, and the magnetic self-compression process produces more energy than continued gravitational contraction. As these currents concentrate, they further compress the plasma, creating plasmoids similar to those seen in the laboratory experiments. The process not only explains the high luminosity of quasars, but also accounts for the observed jets and other phenomena without requiring supermassive black holes or extreme distances. By applying principles observed in plasma physics, Lerner's model offers a more straightforward, plausible explanation for the behaviour of quasars, challenging the mainstream understanding and providing new insights into the nature of these fascinating cosmic objects. The energy source for the laboratory version and the quasar model differ significantly. In the lab, the energy comes from an external energy storage device, whereas in the case of the quasar, the energy is derived from the rotation of the plasma disk, which generates the current. In Lerner's model, the same sequence of events observed in the lab occur in the quasar. As the incoming filaments compress the magnetic field, the magnetic field continues to grow until it reaches a critical level. Beyond this point, synchrotron radiation and axial electromotive force are generated, creating two axial beams, electrons in one direction and protons in the other. The symmetry between the north and the south poles is now broken. The large beam directed out from the decaying plasmoid creates large-scale magnetic fields, which direct incoming currents into the branch from which the beam originated, disrupting the alternate branch. Just as in the laboratory, these beams are created by disrupting individual filaments much smaller than the plasmoid, producing short pulses of ions and electrons. Thus, in the quasar model, at any given time, only a small central region produces the beam and radiation pulses. Lerner discusses that the initial formation stage of the quasar would take a few hundred million years, compressing an area of tens of thousands of parsecs into a plasmoid with a radius of about 10 parsecs. Once the plasmoid is formed, the second stage involves the plasmoid slowly decaying. During this process, it releases its total power through the pulsing of the beams, with each pulse lasting about a year. The decay process would span several hundred thousand years. Laboratory experiments have shown that the magnetic field of self-compression in plasma focus devices results in an increase in energy density of more than a hundred million times, with even larger increases in transferred power density. In Eric Lerner's model, he scales this mechanism up to the size of a quasar, allowing the quasar to derive its energy from a volume nearly one million times larger than the observable quasar. The scaling provides a plausible explanation for the immense luminosity of quasars without requiring the extreme distances and energies posited by the standard model, challenging traditional views and offering new insights into these extraordinary cosmic phenomena. There are several key points that any model of a quasar must be able to account for. The confined jets emitted in opposite directions and the emission of high intensity radiation, which is redshifted. Eric Lerner emphasizes that electromagnetic models which are consistent with laboratory experiments, have been proposed by notable scientists such as Hannes Alfane, Anthony Pratt, David Green, Peter Sturrock and Kenneth Brown. These researchers have clearly demonstrated through experimentation that plasma can be confined to narrow jets. Lerner's model builds on these findings. In his model, as the incoming filaments compress the magnetic field, the growing magnetic field reaches a critical level. At this point, synchrotron radiation and axial electromotive force are generated, creating two axial beams, electrons in one direction and protons in the other. Regarding the redshift observed in the quasar emissions, Lerner proposes that local physical processes within the quasar itself could contribute to this phenomenon. One potential mechanism is intrinsic redshift, where the extreme electromagnetic fields and dynamic plasma conditions within the quasar can shift the frequency of emitted radiation. As charged particles accelerate within the intense magnetic fields, they emit synchrotron radiation, which can be redshifted due to the high energy and density of plasma. 
Additionally, plasma redshift, a process where light loses energy as it interacts with dense plasma, could also play a role. As light traverses high density plasma regions within the quasar, it could lose energy and become redshifted, independent of the object's distance from Earth. By leveraging well-documented electromagnetic processes and the results of laboratory experiments, Lerner's model provides a coherent and testable explanation for the observed characteristics of quasars, including their narrow confined jets and high-intensity red-shifted radiation. While Eric Lerner's plasmoid quasar model offers an intriguing alternative to traditional cosmological explanations for the quasars, it has faced criticism from various quarters within the scientific community. Some of the main criticisms include the lack of observable evidence. Criticism of Lerner's model often centers on the dearth of direct observational evidence buttressing its core hypotheses. While laboratory experiments in plasma physics offer valuable insights, they fall short of replicating the intricate conditions and scale present in astronomical phenomena such as quasars. Consequently, without observational confirmation of the presence of plasmoids, or the specific mechanisms posited by Lerner, his model remains speculative. While direct observation of a plasmoid represents the ultimate goal, the sheer energy and intensity involved make such observations challenging. The difficulty in observing is not unique to Lerner's model. It is also extended to the concept of supermassive black holes. Despite their theoretical prominence, no direct observation of a black hole has been made. However, Lerner's model gains traction due to its reliance on experimental evidence from laboratory plasma physics experiments. These experiments showcase phenomena like plasma self-compression and plasmoid formation, offering crucial insights into plasma behavior under specific conditions and serve to bolster theoretical constructs like Lerner's. In contrast, the concept of black holes, particularly the singularity at their core, remains largely theoretical and lacks direct experimental validation. Although substantial indirect evidence such as gravitational effects on surrounding matter support their existence, the singularity itself remains a mathematical construct derived from general relativity. The inability to create or directly observe a singularity underscores the theoretical nature of black holes. Thus, in terms of experimental evidence supporting fundamental principles, Lerner's model enjoys a comparative advantage over the concept of black holes. Redshift Interpretations Critics argue that Lerner's explanation for redshift in quasar emissions through local plasma processes is not well supported. The majority of astronomers interpret redshift as primarily due to the expansion of the universe, with higher redshift indicating greater distance. Lerner's proposal challenges this interpretation, but it lacks empirical evidence to convincingly replace the cosmological redshift explanation. Scales and energy concerns Lerner's model requires scaling up laboratory plasma processes to explain phenomena observed in quasars, such as their immense energy output. Critics question whether the energies involved in the laboratory experiments can be extrapolated to match the scale and intensity of emissions seen in quasars. The mechanisms proposed by Lerner may not be capable of generating the observed luminosities and redshifts without additional supporting evidence. Theoretical consistency some scientists argue that Lerner's model may not be fully consistent with established principles of astrophysics and cosmology. The proposed mechanisms for plasmoid formation, energy generation, and redshift may conflict with existing theoretical frameworks and observational constraints. Observational evidence. There is some indirect evidence that could be interpreted as support for Eric Lerner's model, particularly when considering the behavior of active galaxies in quasars. One aspect of Lerner's model involves the sudden activation of quasars, driven by processes such as the formation and decay of plasmoids. Interestingly, observations of active galaxies have revealed instances where previously quiescent galaxies suddenly become highly active, exhibiting characteristics akin to those predicted by Lerner's model. These sudden outbursts of activities, sometimes referred to as quasar mode transitions, suggest that something triggered the rapid onset of intense emissions from the central region of the galaxy. While the exact mechanisms underlying these transitions remains uncertain, they align conceptually with Lerner's proposal that plasmoid formation and decay could drive the observed phenomena in quasars. Furthermore, the rapid variability observed in the emissions from active galaxies and quasars is also consistent with the dynamic processes proposed in Lerner's model. The fluctuating intensity and spectral characteristics of these emissions 
could reflect the episodic formation and decay of plasmoids, as well as the interactions between these energy structures and the surrounding plasma environments. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time. <laughs>